Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me well? Translators can hear me well? Great. I'm always concerned about the translators because I know that some of you will listen to me, but some of you will listen to the translators. So they are as important as I am for this meeting. Thank you so much for the translation. And thank you for the organization of this uh, course. I was uh, telling, telling our guest here, our organizer, that this is, um, this is like a two new things that are taking place. The first one is that this is the first time that Jakapap organizes a community course before the Congress. We have been thinking about it for many years, so you can say that Prague is the first place that this was done. So that's, that's history now. Next, year, next two years in Singapore, we'll have one. And following two years in uh, Dubai, we'll have another course. So every time now, there will be community course, trying to approach the community of the place that we have the Congress. The second pioneering aspect has to do with the videotaping. This videotaping will go into the YouTube of Yakapap and will be accessible, freely accessible, from all over the world. So the people from Africa, from Latin America, from Europe, from Asia, will be able to listen to the content of these two conferences. So I think that's, that's a great, great contribution. So thank you and congratulations. I'm, I'm going to tell you about is uh, the project that we are developing. And here you have my disclosure of, of uh, conflicts. Although, uh, honestly, I, I work a little bit for pharmaceutical industry for new products, but the majority of the funding that I use for research comes from the, from the public system. So I, I really have nothing to disclose. I just have to say thank you to all these different agencies that support our work. I'm going to tell you about the autism spectrum disorders. It is a, a developmental disorder, as you know, and is uh, 70 years uh, old. It was discovered in 1948. And as you know, I'm sure you know, uh, because I understand that many of you have contact with autism spectrum disorder, either as a clinician, as, as a family, as a teacher, as a supporters. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to assume that but it's an early limitation in social, communication, sensory, process, and play skills. And we know that the origin is biological, uh, mainly genetic, but we also consider epigenetic factors, and we also consider environmental factors and pre-delivery partners due to pregnancy and so forth. We know now that 50% of them have intellectual disability associated with it. So 50% no, 50% yes. And this is a new population in many countries. In most countries in the world, those with associated intellectual disability are the ones that have been identified so far. But it is another 50% of the population that face these challenges. Now the diagnosis, as in child mental health in general, has to do with the presence of symptoms and the negative impact. So you require to have two things, the symptomatology and the negative impact at personal level, social level, educational level, or family level. But without the impact, there is no diagnosis. There are just characteristics. And that might apply very well to some of the people in the, in the level of what we call neuroatypical. We have a full spectrum a spectrum or autism level number three, which is the, the most disabled ones, uh, autism level two, the average, autism level one, which was the old Asperger, and now we have the neuroatypical. These are people that have some uh, similarities, but they do not consider themselves patients. They say there is no impact, negative impact in their lives. So again, this is new. But when we have a problem, I think it's important to know that in psychiatry in general, we try to diminish the symptoms. And sometimes we are effective in diminishing the symptoms. Let's say that we are able to do some counseling in genetics, or we have new medications, and we are very hopeful 
that new medications will be advanced, or early intervention can diminish the symptoms, or we can treat the comorbidities. In other words, there are many things that doctors can do, doctors and psychologists in general. But, but, you can reduce the impact. And that makes a big difference. So don't, don't say that you cannot treat. You can treat medically, but you can also treat the negative impact. And the negative impact requires educational programs, social support, environmental adaptation, and empowerment of the person. Some people may have this level of symptoms and this level of handicap, this level of negative impact. All this may have the opposite because they, they are in a place where people understand them and support them. But if they support you, then you get much more impact. So we all have to collaborate in this regard. Let me tell you briefly about the program that uh, Andres Martin uh, illustrated. This is the Gautena program. Gautena means uh, Gautena Autism Society in Basque. Sorry about the Basque. It's a beautiful language. Very difficult, though. I agree. The population is one-third of Prague. Uh, we, we devote ourselves to one region, one county, the county of Gipuzkoa, and the population is 700,000. And for us, it's very important to consider the small dimension. We think big, but we act small, if you know what I mean. We say we cannot offer services to the whole country of Spain or to the whole town of Prague, but we can take this part of Prague and develop coherent services here, and then another ones, another there. The size really matters. So for this population of 710,000 people, we had already now supported 800 families, which is a lot of families. And the people that work in the program is 236 staff persons. Now, do you imagine that in Prague, multiplied by three, that will be 700 uh, staff people working for autism if we had the same numbers, 68% full-time. As you see there, we are very lucky to have developed over the last years, between 1980 to 18, a lot of years in fact, a network of services. We have clinics located in less than 25 kilometers. Our countryside is very hilly. It has a lot of mountains and valleys. And when you have mountains and valleys, people don't like to, to travel. They think it's too far, and it's just 10 kilometers, but it's across the border. So then we have to open these clinics around. Uh, clinics that are under the national health system, so they are fully free. Then we have the classrooms for autism. You see that out of the 500 children that we have, 400 are in regular schools with support, and 95 are in our classrooms in regular school. That means special classrooms, open classrooms in regular schools. Some years ago, we closed the special school we had. We decided to close it, not because of political aspects or economic aspects. We said it doesn't make sense to put together kids that do not know how to play, how to talk, how to relate, and keep them here 10 years and wait until they develop that. So we, want to, we use the normal peers and the normal form. So we took the tables, the children, and the teachers, and we moved to regular schools. And we have this network of 16, 17 classrooms now. Well, the same goes with group homes. We do not have institutions, big institutions or hospitals. We have small villas, small flats, small group homes with, uh, where people live in the community. Day centers, the same for the community. We are connected to the, self, to the employment agency as well and the shelter employment agency. We have leisure, support to families, and also short stays, what we used to call in the old days the respite care. Uh, so there is a full network of, uh, of services. And uh, let me tell you that nobody has given this as a present. We had to fight every time for every resource, every year. So don't, don't think that this is just paradise. You have to fight. The budget distribution is 92% uh, of the money comes from the government. 8% comes from the family. But the families receive a subsidy 
if they have a, a person with disability. So they take the money with one hand and they give the money to us to the other hand. If the family doesn't get money, no subsidy, no income from them. It's free. And uh, you'll see the distribution, the majority of the program is paid by the social services department, the public authority and education authority one third, a little bit of the bus health, we want to increase that, and the 8% of the families. This is the example of average costs. The classroom is about $34 uh, dollars per year. Community housing, 50,000 per year. And the activity center, 18,000 per year. We just finished a study, a European study, and we found that in 14 nations, the amount of money estimated for a given family by public expenditure plus family expenditures plus loss of hours of work lost by the parents, it was about 30,000 euros per six months in Europe. So it's, it's an expensive um, problem. Um, now, in terms of the recognition, as uh, our leader said, we were recognized by the European Parliament in 2016 with the European Citizen Award. And the most important thing is the explanation that they gave uh, the parliamentary people. They said, we give this award because this exemplifies the role of the European values and models in providing support to people in need. And we thought that, that was great that they considered that. So let me tell you about the menu. This is the menu of the Jess Cafe Restaurant. I'm not sure what it is, but it's, uh, it's, it's here. And uh, I'm going to tell you about the menu of today. It's a long menu, seven plates. Two, four, six plates, sorry, six plates, long enough. Understanding autism, identifying ASD, diagnosing, treating, supporting, and a closing triple vision. And we'll have a break in the middle, approximately in half an hour or 35 minutes. The first one, understanding autism. For me, I think it's important to understand how, how social skills got developed in humankind. And here you have the, the, the relationship between the mean body weight and the size of the brain. And you see that there is a huge increase in Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, and Basque Homo uh, at the end. Uh, in other words, the body didn't change much the proportion, but we had larger and larger brains. So that allowed us to have bioprograms, some kind of programs in our brain and physiology that will ensure two things that are important for human beings. First, to survive, and two, to ensure descendants. In terms of how to explain this, I think I like Lena Waterhouse's uh, explanation of the mechanisms of social co-regulation, as she, as she mentions. First, the first system is the couple co-regulation, one-to-one. One-to-one because you have a baby and you give milk to the baby, or you, you make love to one person. This is a couple uh, social co-regulation. It's, it's very brief, it's very pleasurable, and we, are, we have built-in mechanisms to promote that. If not, we will die. Uh, because you know the baby uh, cannot, cannot manage by him or herself. So this is the most simple thing, to, to get the mechanisms to regulate just on a one-to-one -one basis and to obtain pleasure for that, like this baby. Then uh, how does that happen? Let me tell you about the microtus. I don't know if you have microtus here in, uh, in Czechia, uh, you probably have. Uh, in Spain, I'm not sure. But they are, uh, they are in the States. And Tom Insel is the guy that studied this at uh, Emory University. And then he became the director of the National Institute of Health in the States for years. Very important person. And what he did was he considered these two microtus. The microtus ocrogaster, which is the microtus that is in the prayers, and the Microtus Montanus, who is high in the mountains. And the two are equal, but completely different, the point of view of social skills. The one on the prayer, 
down below is social. The one in the mountains is non-social, is isolated. Many human beings are, are that way either. But the one down below has excellent parenting functioning. He takes care of the kids. The other one in the mountains doesn't, doesn't play with the children, <coughs> couldn't care less. The one down is a very loyal partner, the one for your whole life, is your couple forever. Uh, the one in the mountains is promiscuous, if you can call a microtus or promiscuous, but they, they change continuously of partners. The one down, uh, if you separate it from the group, it gets very uncomfortable. The other one couldn't care less if you get separated. So here you have the same animal with a complete different repertoire in social development and social behavior. And Tom Insel said, why? Well, what is different between these two? And he found that there was a difference in the brain receptors of oxytocin and vasopressin. And he was able to manipulate these receptors, sticking oxytocin in the amygdala of this uh, microtus, and he changed for a number of hours. The one in the mountains became very social, or removed the amygdala, and then became the one that became like the cousin in the mountain. So he was very manipulative, and he also produced knockout um, microtus, and the same thing happened. By the way, we are starting a project now in Europe with a vasopressin-like medication for children with autism spectrum disorder. And oxytocin has been tried for years, but there is a problem with oxytocin only needs to be given IV, or if not, <laughs> aspirated. And you cannot have people on IV or aspirate the oxytocin uh, continuously, but it works. This lady at the University of Washington, Seattle, is a study, what we call the baby talk. And basically what she found is that uh, for the first six months of life, she says, the children, the babies, are citizens of the world. They react, the brain react to any language. Chinese, Basque, Czech, Spanish, equally. But by 12 months, it makes a difference, the environment they are. So they become citizen of a given country. And it's in this social context that you learn now, we know that the babies with autism spectrum disorder do not prefer the baby talk as compared to the standard noises. For them, it's the same. For the neurotypical babies, the baby talk is more attractive. We all speak baby talk. Even the young kids speak baby talk. Nobody has to teach us. It's something like this. Oh, el bebé, uh, uh, que bien está. We elevate the pitch, we repeat, we speak very simple, but the content is complex, and we, and we approach 30, 30 centimeters to the face. So we are very good in baby talk, but they are not good in processing that. The language and maturation is different. And this is a very old study that illuminated our, our knowledge of autism. And that's by Robert Schultz, many, many years ago. He put on the CT scan, functional scan, also how people reacted to chairs and how people reacted to faces. Faces expressing emotions. And what he found that for chairs, the person with autism disorder and ourselves react with the same area, the inferior temporal gyrus. We illuminate that section of the brain. If, on the other hand, we are exposed to faces with emotional aspects, we illuminate the fusiform gyrus for the faces. And you know what? The persons with Asperger disorder in those cases illuminated the one for the chairs, not the one for the faces. So they process the faces in the same way that they process the chairs. No wonder they find difficult to process our facial expression, our double meaning, our intention, all of that, because the brain does not illuminate in the same way that it does to us. This is why they don't, they don't process social stimuli as we process. It's not that they want or they do not want. 
is that it does not illuminate. It's like I say to the family, it's like saying, looking at my elbow and telling me if I am happy or sad by looking at my elbow. And nobody knows. Well, they look at my face, and it's the same as looking at my elbow. Okay? By the way, it was found that years after treatment, they illuminate the brain. Another area, not, this, not the same one, but they can learn. Where a neurotypical kid looks at, this is the eye of the child that is watching this, this video with a young baby, young child with a, with a truck playing, and look at where the neurotypical uh, child looks at. Eyes, hand, the truck, but the eyes. This is what the so the child looks the same. Looks a little bit at the face, at the truck, then somebody that is doing running right there, then to the corner, then to the basketball balls and the basketball area. Look at how different this is. The vision of the world that one has and the other has. So this is the visual interaction between a neurotypical girl and a boy with probably ASD. And you see the girl is looking face, face, face to face, while the child with autism is looking at the basket, not at the, child, at the girl. So in summary, they, they interpret a different world. They have a limited a social vision of their environment. They have a different interpretation of the world. And we are trained, we develop, to explain everything under the social aspect. If somebody tells you, how was your vacation before the, the thieves entered in the apartment? Was, was the vacation good? You don't think about the physical aspects of the place. You think about the time you spend with the people and the social part. And we organize ourselves in social levels. So uh, children and others with autism are not good at that. So the interpretation of the world is different. They don't understand well. They, they look more to the mouth than to the eyes. And the more, the more they look to the mouth, the better they understand. That's probably because the language can be better understood than the visual expression. The second level of co-regulation is the group co-regulation. In the development of humankind, it was very important to synchronize with other people. It was very important that if, if, you, if you were to hunt, you will look at you, the others and see who is throwing the stone to the, to the animal, who is moving, who is hiding. It was, it was very important to discover who was part of your group or your tribe and who was not. One was your friend, the other might be your enemy. It was important to understand how the other people felt. In other words, in this, in this period of life, we have started showing shared attention and shared emotions. And we have a system of mirror neurons and canonical neurons that help us to imitate without wanting to imitate. It's automatically. We imitate each other. Well, of course, that doesn't go well in autism as well. And the finally, the third level of time is the timeless co-regulation. In the first two, you need a person to be there. In the third one, you don't need. It's an atemporal co-regulation. Uh, you can tell people with language what has happened, how do you go hunting, what are the tricks that you use, or you can use art and you can paint in your cave how the people hunted the animals. In other words, you can regulate situations that are not happening right there. These are the three basic mechanisms that humankind develop during the process of development. And these are the three mechanisms that reproduce in the children. You know, the ontogenity development parallels the phylogenetic development. What this, this piece, what the humankind did, then is reproduced in the baby. The different steps. So these three mechanisms are limited in autism spectrum disorders. And I think it's important to understand it. It's not that they don't want. 
is that they do not know is that the brain does not produce something that we don't teach to kids how to produce, how to do. It just comes, evolves. In autism, we know that there are limited development of emotional implication. There are challenges for sensory modulation. Some people have difficulties with noises, with silences, with taste, with touch. Um, limited development of imitation and sharing. They have, many of them have many troubles in understanding mental states. Mental states are the bubbles that you put in comic. You can imagine what the person is thinking. Just by knowing the person and looking what the person does, you can understand the person. And sometimes they have difficulties for abstract thinking and symbolism. In other words, they have very basic limitations in all these areas. In terms of identification, it's important to identify them soon. And the sooner, the better. And we're making tremendous progress in that. For identification, you can go, you can regard backwards and frontwards. If you look backwards, you must be, you must consider some at-risk population. If you have at-risk population, please don't sit still. Search and find out if the child has difficulties in social co-regulation and communication. For example, children with uh, some diseases like tuberous sclerosis, neurofibromatosis, ex-fragile intellectual disability, another possibility, children that were born when the age of the father was really high, older fathers. And in many parts of the world, now kids are born to older parents because people want to wait to have children until they are well established, so to speak. They have a job, they have a house, they have everything, but they have age. And while in Down syndrome, we blame the mother, in autism, we blame the father. The father or the grandfather. The grandfather, maternal grandfather, when the maternal grandfather gave birth to the mother. So that's epigenetics, again. We know that uh, the intake of folic acid is very good to prevent autism. So in Scandinavian countries, people start, before becoming pregnant, they start, the ladies start having folic uh, supplements. In Spain, nobody does that. Sometimes when they get pregnant, they start, but not before. Uh, and sometimes just for a period of time. Valproic acid is a scandal now in Spain. I don't know about the Czech Republic, but it's going to be like the thalidomide um, problem. We know that there is a coincidence of valproic acid, the depakin, was the name of the product, is excellent for epilepsy, and is given to, has been given to, to mothers during pregnancy. And we know that it's associated with uh, autism, with uh, intellectual disability, with many, many, many problems. So now they're making a big fuss about it, and I think all the doctors, although we knew this, the, the general doctors were not aware of that. The thalidomide also, by the way, was involved with autism. And again, as you will see, if you have siblings with the autism spectrum disorder, so these are populations that we know that have higher risk than the general population. So if you have something to do with them, look at them, search, just in case. There are, there are some materials. This material is uh, comparing video clips at about one year of age. And this is done by Rebecca Landa by the, from the Kennedy Cricket Institute, and it's an internet. And, and you see examples of one year of children with autism and children without autism, neurotypical kids and it's very informative. We think it's important to consider, for early identification, to consider problems, developmental problems, in all the children. We are not in favor of saying, we're going to make a screening program for autism. We say, we're going to make a screening program for every developmental disorder, including autism, but also deafness, also blindness, also cerebral palsy, also intellectual disability, which are the most common disabilities that we have in our countries. 
Um, we develop some uh, systems that we provided by the government for free to, uh, to pediatricians, to health clinics, to nurseries, so the could, people could uh, identify symptoms and presence of things, problems of development that were not um, that were not good. We were not interested, let me tell you this, we were not interested in the, in the ones that did very well, the first 50%. So for every item, like the first one, recognizes his name, is oriented towards his name. If you say, Johnny, Johnny looks at you. We know that 50% start by the age of 10 or 9, 9 and a half. 75% do that by almost 11 months. And 95% do by 12 months. The last child I diagnosed last week, that was the suspicious. The pediatrician said it's not good because he's not oriented himself to his name. And he was right. The problem is that for the pediatrician, that was something pathological at age two, and the child was two, three months. And that had been present from the beginning. And we know that it was not the case. At 12 months, is not normal. So we, we study 800 children here and 2,000 in Barcelona. Oh, here is Sebastian and 2,000. And we found out the development expands. So it's not pass or not pass, it's an expansion. So it's important to, to, to assess this. So you survey all these people, and in case of doubt, there are instruments, free instruments, uh, that you have to, to see if they are translated into Czech. Uh, if not, ask them to translate, and support them to translate. The people from the chat are the most friendly people in the world, and they will, they will help you if it is not translated. And there are two mechanisms. One is the questionnaire, and then the other one is the follow-up. So if a child is suspect of having, then you get the phone and you ask, and you ask a few questions, and you decide the risk. And if it's positive, you call the child to the clinic and assess the child. And this is very simple, it's free, and it's been done all over the world. So we have a good instrument free instrument to identify. And we use that for uh, 24 months, between 18 and 24 months. We got a sample in Spain of 22,000 babies and apply the cast, the chat. Okay, delay identification. There are, there are other children that do not get identified when they were babies. And they get identified later on, around six years or so. And these are kids that had been undercover. They can manage until society becomes too complex and they need to be identified them. Some people that may not relate very well with mates, with peers, not very good in social rules, um, they don't understand double language, verbal communication not very effective, and they have peculiar interests, usually not social interests, like dinosaurs or, or cars and things that are apersonal, that are not human beings. They have good speech, and very often they are suspected ADHD, attention deficit disorder, because they don't attend, they don't pay attention. They pay attention to what is interesting for them, not what is interesting for the teacher which is a big difference. In case of concern, again, you have this instrument. There are many instruments, but the cast is free. It's being translated in many, many languages, and this comes from Simon Baron Cohen from the University of Cambridge, and again, it's, it's very useful. So please uh, have those instruments at hand. The consequence, the, the, I mean, the, the definition is to, to make a general surveillance of all the children and then a screening of children with difficulties. I must confess that in Spain, we, we, 
We spoke about this. But we are not good in doing that. It's like if the pediatrician will measure or weight the child that looks very small or really pumpy. And we say, no, you have to measure all of them. You have to check development in all of them children. It takes two minutes, three minutes to do that. So please, every child in Spain goes to the pediatrician like six times in the next four years. So spend two minutes searching for development. And if you have concern about a particular problem, then apply the screening. But I start with general surveillance. The other possibility is to go from the current moment on, instead of going backwards, retrospective diagnosis, to go prospective diagnosis. And to do that, there are many projects in Europe and in the, in the world, and this is the Euro SIPs. We know that the siblings born after the child with autism spectrum disorder has more risk of being autistic again, repeating. So we cannot screen all the kids in Prague, but we can focus on children that have risk and in children that have older brothers and sisters with uh, autism. And this is the, the project that is going on now in Europe, by the way, these kids are reviewed at the age of five, 10, 14, two years, and three years. These prospective studies are discovering things that we didn't know. Amy Klein, which is the master in many of these studies, has found that these children by the age of 24 months, I'm talking about the children at risk that later develop autism. They have a decline in visual fixation to people. The same was found in terms of showing an integrated smiling, which is this way. At the age of eight months, the children, if they have this, this uh, small toy there, this is one of these things that moves like this, child first smiles at the, at the movement, and then smiles at the adult, saying, look at that. What is that? Shares that. Those uh, sheeps at risk, those siblings at risk, didn't do that. And they predicted that later on, they will be diagnosed autism. So we are starting to discover many aspects for these babies at risk. This is a, a summary of uh, the Canadian studies. In Canada, they've been doing this uh, baby follow-up, uh, baby at risk follow-up for years. And they found something that at first nobody believed. That there is that in the first six months of life, there was nothing that you could say. Development was completely normal for these children. And many of us, thought, well, maybe the parents didn't know. Maybe they didn't realize there was something. There is nothing. When you follow those babies at risk, of the first six months, there is nothing. Between six and 12, things start to change. Between 12 and 18, change more. And by 24, the full picture is developed. So it's an evolving condition. And that's, that complicates diagnosis. It's easier if you have a pneumonia, and all of a sudden you have pneumonia, than when you have to look something that is uh, developing. Basically, as you can imagine, this is the orientation to name that it does not appear, the smiling, social interaction, imitation. Very often, they found that these kids, these babies, were very passive at six months. And that was followed by an exaggerated reaction on 12 months. So there was a big change in their behavior. And they spent a lot of time with visual fixation to objects instead of people, looking at objects and looking at the light, how it reflects in my watch, looking at physical aspects. Um, that, was, that was very typical of these kids. And by 12 months, there was a decrease in language production. 
and in language understanding. They follow, at the time I had this uh, data, they had followed 277 new ships of uh, AC cases, new brothers and sisters. By the age of third, at that time, at 36 months, 25% had been diagnosed. So that means that one quarter of these children develop, these ships develop autism spectrum disorders. A word of caution, caution. We do not know if these families are representative of all the families. These were families that wanted to enter this study. And it may be because they had some family origin and they know Uncle Joan and the cousin uh, brother that had some symptoms and this is why they were interested. In other words, you have to take into account that this is a self-selected group, the ones that go for this follow-up. So it not, might not be representative, but the picture is about the same in all the countries. So you get the feeling that it's fairly representative for the general population. Diagnosis. Of course, you, we follow the DSM-5. I presume that you, that you follow the DSM-5 here. Uh, if you go to internet, you have the, all the symptoms, the collection of symptoms, very easy to uh, find. But I always say it's a pity that the children that we see have not read the DSM-5 because they do not reproduce all the symptoms. If they have read the book, they would tell us everything, but they don't. In other words, we have kids that have and don't have, that have partial, and that's life, okay? So it's not your problem, it's the problem of fitting the persons into the definition. It will be lovely for definition purposes, but not for the kids. The other thing is that very often we find people that say, oh, he look at the eye one time, two times. This is not autism. And we know this is not ever or always. It's all these symptoms sometimes are there, but they are less frequent than a standard, than what you expect for the development of the child. So it's not as clear as saying yes or no. Very often it's clear that it's less frequent, they are more limited, but it's not full absence of this development. And sometimes with some, with some adults, they relate very different than with other adults. So you, you gotta get multiple observations of, from multiple people. But above all, for diagnosis, you get to know the individual. This is uh, the EPEC, and here we have the profile. And, and this is a good example because many of these children have a profile in peaks and valleys. Very, very good in one area, very bad in the other. Very good in one, very bad in the other. Very often the puzzles, the visual memory, and the gross motor are up there. While uh, knowledge, numbers, memory, vision, and language are below. So it's important to know the profile because other kids have a different profile of mountains. And it's crucial to know the profile. So to get to know the individual, and also to get to know the context. The kids are in families, are in context. This is San Sebastian, by the way. It's not, it's not as beautiful as Prague, but it's, it's, not, it's not a bad place, as you can see. It's a nice place. Okay. It's important to use clinical instruments. It's important to say, oh, he said, this person, he or she said, this child has autism. So what? I mean, you need instruments. What instruments? Why? Well, first to understand the person. If you know the profile, you will understand many of the behaviors of the person. It's important to measure the profile again in two years and see what has happened to the mountains and to the valleys to see what progress has been done. If we are very smart, we use the peaks, raise the valleys. 
challenging, it's difficult, but we are good, we do that. It's important to have clinical instruments uh, for research. If you are involved in good demanding research, they're going to tell you ATI, ADOs, mandatory. And if not, nobody enters into the research. Uh, we just enter a project, the European project, the most expensive, the most ambitious project of new drugs. 50% paid by the European government, 50% by the industry, 117 million euros, which is a lot of money, five years. But in order to enter those studies, you need the ADI, the ADDOS. In terms of clinical diagnosis, you don't need that. And there are other instruments. The ATI and the ADOs are expensive, and you need to be trained. And the ADOs is awfully expensive. But you have other instruments like the CARS, the vinyl and two, the IQ test, that are not as expensive. So use, use the cheap ones for that, unless you want. Now, I'm very impressed by this, uh, this exam, this instrument, because it's free. And this is the, the Mount Sinai uh, Hospital in New York. And this is the autism mental status examination. You get everything in internet, and it's uh, very simple. They have examples, videos, how to get trained. And it's, it's worth, yeah, it's worth going that. So you have to personalize and you have to contextualize. Autism, I say, has a name. One, you see a child with autism, and you see the second one, they're completely different. They may have the same problem, but they're different. And you gotta go beyond the barriers of diagnosis. Diagnosis is important, but then you say, tell me about the child. How is this child? How is the context? What are the goals? When we talk about treating, that would be the next section, you must start with diagnosis. But diagnosis is not just the clinical diagnosis. It's the personal diagnosis and the family diagnosis, the context diagnosis, okay? The diagnosis does not occur in a vacuum. It occurs in a context. And I think it's very important to consider that. 